technology. Oh, now it's overboard. <laughs> we down? Okay, there we go. Okay, now, good morning. No wonder you didn't say good morning. Uh, good morning. I'm Jeff Jarvis from the City University of New York Graduate School of Journalism. Uh, I'm here with an amazing uh, cadre of smart people to talk about the moral basis of the future. Um, Maria Ressa, who is my journalistic hero, um, indeed, uh, who, as we all know, uh, is uh, surviving brave conditions of journalism and standing up for what we believe in in the Philippines. Um, uh, Indira Lakshmanan from uh, Pointer, uh, uh, ethicist there. Uh, we need one. Uh, Janine Gibson, uh, my, my dear friend from long ago in different lives, now heading up BuzzFeed UK and doing amazing journalistic work there. Uh, Raju Narazetti, uh, most recently at uh, uh, Gizmodo Media Group, uh, still, still. Um, also uh, suffering uh, valleys of death there too, I think, but, uh, but managing to make that work. Let me give you just a moment's background on, on this odd topic. So uh, I have befriended, uh, been befriended by a guy named Dove Seidman at LRN, a company that um, helps companies understand their moral behavior. And he started a, a non-for-profit called the Howe Institute. And together we wanted to look at a higher level view of the moral bases of the decisions that are being made by both platform and media companies and to understand what that is. And, I, and I've been talking to some smart people about this as I go, and one of the smartest I know of is, of course, my friend and mentor, Jay Rosen. And Jay pointed out that we seem to have assumptions about what we expect of, for example, the platform companies, but we really don't have the terms of that discussion. We really haven't yet discussed uh, what their public responsibilities are. What is it we expect of them? What are those ranges? So I'm gonna to try to work on this project and I'm cheating by having all this fill, room filled with smart brains help do that. And to start to discuss what's on the table and what's off the table when it comes to the ethical and moral bases and imperatives of the decisions that we are making. In our media world, uh, for example, right now today we see, oh I should give you a full disclosure. I accepted money at my school from uh, Facebook, Craig Newmark Philanthropies, uh, Ford Foundation, AppNexus, and others to start the News Integrity Initiative headed by Molly Diagyar, who is here somewhere on campus. Uh, I am independent of Facebook. I receive no personal funds whatsoever from any of the platforms. End of disclosure. Um, uh, but if we look at our own media bases, we're, everyone's screaming about the business model, the business model of Facebook. Well, it's the business model that we started. And a volume-based, attention-based business model in advertising takes you pretty inevitably now to clickbait. A subscription model, which we think is our salvation, also redlines journalism and makes it uh, the property of the elite. These are moral bases of decisions. How the platforms operate. Do they have a responsibility to the public information and the public conversation? What is their responsibility to society? That is the incredibly broad question for this morning. Uh, and they were smart enough to put us uh, up here before we were too tired at the end of the day. So that's it. That's all I really have to start with. And I wanted to uh, turn it over to anyone in the panel to talk about what do you think is on the table and off the table when it comes to both platforms and media? What are our expectations of their moral behavior and responsibility in society? Nothing less than that. Maria. Oh, my gosh. Okay. I didn't want to be first. Um, <laughs> what are the moral and ethical basis? I mean, I think it's really simple. As a person, I would just say the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And I think the biggest problem that we have right now is that the old world, the standards and ethics of traditional journalism, which we in this room live with, g were groomed with, we grew up with, we created organizations with, that is a little bit stupid in the new world of platforms because it doesn't get you the reach, it doesn't get you all of the rewards that engagement does. So the dilemma, I think, and I'll shut up after this, is just don't. to transition from our old world where we were handcuffed and, and, and actually uh, voluntarily handcuffed ourselves because we understood the great responsibility that we had to transition from that world to this new world where 
the, the tech guys made these decisions without any of the realization, without any of the standards and ethics that we walked into our businesses with. I think that's the biggest problem. What, what were the, define the handcuffs, and was there anything wrong with our handcuffs? So I won't go into the commercial yet, but in mm -hmm. the practice of journalism, standards and ethics, right? You don't do this for yourself. You know from the very beginning that, that you were there, responsible to get all sides. If we were in this room, the, the woman sitting here has a very different view from the guy sitting in the back, standing up, looking at me, waving my hand, right? And then, and Jeff's view here. They're all accurate, they're all equal. They don't have to fight with each other. It was the journalist's role to actually pull that up into a big picture view and tell you the why. I think what's wrong is that now, when we talk about moral and ethical, we forget the main, the mission of journalism, which is more important today than at any other time. And that is meaning, right? Um, we were, we don't get stuck on the facts because those authoritarian um, leaders will get you to the, to the molecule of water without context. And when they do that, then they can manipulate it into whichever way they want. So meaning, context, right. So translate that into your platform. And, and I, I will confess fully that my own sin, I think now as I see as a sin, is that I was a, a dogmatist on behalf of openness. The internet is open, the internet is, is equal, the internet is edge to edge, and I still want to believe in that, but we didn't see how much that opened us to manipulation. I think we saw it much, much earlier in the Philippines, and we certainly brought it to the platforms because we saw the manipulation that was happening. Um, I always say that the Philippines is the harbinger. We were six months ahead of the United States, and now all of the data that is coming out is showing that exactly. Um, how, do I tr how do we translate it? I think this idea of openness is bogus. Sorry, right? Um, I love him, but we disagree on a few things. Because no, I'm, 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 I'm <laughs> confessing the, the ills of my ways, yes. Um, you know, in the end, I went back over when I started dealing with Facebook when the problems started coming out and they were the end of 2015, the beginning of 2016. And uh, they went back to your responsibility when you build the house. You know, you can't let people come in and then just start shooting each other in your area of influence. That's why it goes right back to uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, right? It's very fundamental in that sense. Our standards and ethics as journalism, as journalists, we took them to the highest degree, but in the end, it comes down to that. They built this house, they invited us all in, and then they said, well, you guys shoot each other out, and in the end, if you can, and it's really mob rule, if you can get more people to take your side, then you can shoot anyone else. So one, one more question for you, while you're off the hook. Um, so, so I hear here as a standard, to anticipate and a to... A responsibility, accountability, that's... Uh, right. Sorry. No, a responsibility and accountability to anticipate and protect from manipulation. Absolutely. Okay, so define manipulation. Okay, well, I can say from what we've seen, right, which is to use both the technology, so that's bots, algorithms, and to actually create artificial um, consensus. Uh, that's what we've seen in the Philippines, and you've seen it in other parts of the world, uh, where you can get um, people believing that turning right is the right way when the, the truth is turning left. And I know it gets into all of these things about what is truth and what is not truth, but in the end, we're all starting out in reality. And while the ideal was to give everyone, to empower everyone, um, someone still makes the call on which voice has the, high, the greatest power. In our democracies, it is the vote. On Facebook, on Twitter, it's algorithms programmed by human beings. So what were those implicit assumptions? They were mob rule assumptions. So that's gotta be fixed because you cannot treat the New York Times the same way that you would treat uh, Joe Schmo blog talking about what great food there is in Perugia, sorry. You know, it's like, these are fundamentals. There have to be some connection to reality. You can't just say, uh, otherwise you get what we have, which is, you know, I feel like Alice in Wonderland and the Mad Hatter is in charge, and we gotta get through it. And, and, and the, the judgments are needed, and I think we see the beginning of, of Google, Facebook, and Twitter all starting to make judgments, and you believe- Why so late? But sh sh they, you be some believe they shouldn't make judgments. We don't want them to make judgments. You want them to make judgments. I think they have to. They, they have to. It. Yes. They have to, they have no choice. Every human being, you may not want to make a judgment or to make a call, but when you're involved in society, you do make a call just by basically choosing where do you sit? 
You made a call when you went into this room. You chose your seats. Simple, right? That's, that determines your perspective. Indira, yeah. so you have the job title of ethicist, <laughs> which is... Um, um, a daunting one. Yes. <laughs> uh, but you think about this all the time. You think about this from a media perspective. So both from media perspective and from platform perspective, and I'm not saying the platforms are media companies. Let's put that argument off for another day. Uh, I will. I'll say it. Uh, I actually okay. disagree, but that's why I will put it off. Um, but from your perspective, what ties together the ethical bases? Well, I have to say that as, as I was listening to Maria talk, I was thinking back to 20 years ago when Maria and I ran the streets of Asia together as correspondents. She for CNN, an Asia correspondent for CNN, and me, an Asia correspondent for the Boston Globe. And I was thinking about what a different time that was. Oh, um, and you know, 20 years doesn't sound like a long time, but it is many, many, many lifetimes and generations in news gathering in the sense that 20 years ago, the two of us were gatekeepers. We really were. We we were the ones who were sort of observing what was happening, the fall of Suharto, um, you know, the East Timor revolution, the, the crisis, the economic crisis, all of those things, and we were deciding what our news consumers were going to get. And, um, and it was such a completely different way than it is now. And, you know, I think that it's easy for us who come from legacy media, and it's funny for me to call CNN legacy media, but truly <laughs> in today's climate, leg, you know, CNN is legacy media. Bloomberg, where I worked for eight years, I consider legacy media now. Things have changed so much. Um, and, and thinking back to how the change was so radical and happening under our feet, and we didn't even realize it. And between leaving Asia, uh, I left in 2003, and in that year before I became our Asia, or Latin America Bureau Chief, I was doing a Neiman Fellowship, you know, thinking about big thoughts, unaware that Mark Zuckerberg across campus was inventing Facebook. <laughs> Literally. Like, everything I did that Neiman year is now it's just garbage. Who cares? <laughs> it's nothing. Because a 17, 18-year-old kid was creating Facebook and completely changing the ground under my feet and every other journalist's feet forever. So, you know, I got to Latin America, um, you know, Facebook wasn't big yet, it was just new. And then I think about the change between that and coming to Washington and how absolutely everything by the time I got to Washington in 2007 was completely different in the way we gather news and the way we delivered news and over the last 10 years how that's continued to change. I think from a media perspective, it's obvious what our moral imperatives are. They're the same that they always have been, which is to educate, to inform, um, you know, to connect people. In doing that, we have to be transparent. I'm a huge evangelist for transparency as a way of building building trust in journalism, restoring trust in journalism. I can talk about that much more. But, um, you know, all of that goes back to we have to be accountable as news organizations. Um, but it goes back to the sort of thing of, like, inform people, seek the truth, um, and, you know, minimize harm while you deliver, while you maximize your truth-telling. I think the thing with platform companies and you know, we can certainly debate what they are. I thought it was interesting that Sheryl Sandberg last week was interviewed by NPR and Steve Inskeep, the host, opened up a question by asking her, so, um, you know, Facebook is a publisher, blah, 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 blah. He just stuck it into the question, obviously, to see what she would do if she would dispute it. She didn't dispute it. She didn't correct him and say, Steve, I want to stop you there. We're not actually a publisher. She completely let it go, and she answered the question with him. Yesterday, Mark Zuckerberg, in his second day of testimony on Capitol Hill, was asked, are you a publisher? And he said, well, Congressman, if what your question is, do we have a responsibility for the content that is on our platform, then yes, we do have a responsibility. So I thought that was interesting. He sort of sidestepped the thing, but they seem to have be in a different place than they were even six months or a year ago on this. And I think where we get down to this question of where it becomes difficult is when you're educating, connecting, and above all for the platforms, connecting people and trying to create this open space, there are so many potential problems along the way that we've seen happen, and that's from misinformation, the spread of extremist content, the spread of hate speech, the incredible harassment to which particularly women and minorities are subject online, all of these bad things that come with having this open, connected system. And I think those are all, I'll stop, but I think those are all things that we need to grapple with as part of the moral responsibility. All right. Given, I think we have a bunch of assumptions about our ethical and moral responsibility in media. So let me, let me st since that's your job, let me stay with that for a second. Sure. The mess that we're in as a world right now, the polarization that we're in, mm -hmm. 
don't we in media bear tremendous responsibility for that? That we put the world into two buckets, whether that's red and blue or white and black or, 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 or whatever those buckets are. We have a structure that likes narrative and argument. We like, we have a business model that favors uh, clicks and, and invented that and, and attention for its own sake. Um, don't we need to do some more self-examination of our role in media before we start throwing rocks at the new kids? I think we can do both at the same time. Mm -hmm. I don't think we just have to examine our house first and have every single you know, box checked before we criticize other people. We can do both, criticize ourselves and criticize them. But you're absolutely right that we have not done it perfectly. I'm not suggesting we have. And you know, there are different players in the media space. I'm not saying that everybody is the same and that everybody, I, I think everybody should have at their core, if they're news media companies, they should have these same values of educating and informing and frankly speaking, creating, um, you know, the more digital that companies have become, the more that media companies, not just platforms, are also a platform for civic engagement and for civil conversation. We do that through comment sections. Um, we do that in a whole host of ways. Um, so, you know, we certainly were not platforms, but we're also giving people a space to engage with us directly. Shouldn't we be platforms? Well. I mean, from a technological point of view, I can't really answer that, but I'm saying that we are creating platforms for people to have, hopefully, civil mm -hmm. conversations, and it starts with old-fashioned radio call-in shows. I mean, I'm a regular guest host for, uh, for public radio shows where people call in and they pick it up and you give them a chance to air their views on the radio and talk to the guests, and you know, I'm always really, again, an evangelist for Make it keeping it civil. Like everyone should, everyone has a space to talk. We've but pretty much failed civil. at that, haven't we? I think, I think, yeah, society has. And when you say this, that we have, we like narrative structures that induce conflict, I think you're right about that. And I think it's a real problem. I personally have a real problem with both sides journalism, which has been a tradition yeah. for a long time of like, oh, well, you know, blah, blah, blah. They say the world is round, but they say the world is flat. Hmm, let's okay. ponder that. Yeah. You know, I think. I think particularly where we are now in a more polarized political environment than I've ever experienced in my life, I think that we do have to go back to our essential base proposition of being truth tellers. And if being truth tellers means we have to say, well, that side's actually not right. Um, I think that's okay. I don't think you have to give equal balance to every argument. Like I am not, and, and, and actually you mentioned Jay Rosen. Jay Rosen tweeted something out last night which I thought was really interesting. It was a New York Times article about climate change that, that did not give sort of equal rate, weight to climate ch change denial. And, um, and Jay was making the point that this is an evolution, that a few years ago you would, have still, you would have still seen, well, this, but this, you know, Nazis are bad, but some people say Nazis are good. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we did see that just a few months ago, of course, and I don't think uh, that's correct. I think we also have to, when some things are, it's not partisanship, it's about, you know, some things are just morally right and wrong, or some things are just factually right and wrong, and we ha also have to be willing to call stuff out. That is our job as journalists. Janine. You live across both worlds. Um, uh, publication that we both uh, love and respect, The Guardian, and then on to BuzzFeed, a publication that, that engages us. What did I say? Hopefully we love and respect BuzzFeed too. <laughs> That's what I was about to get to. I was about to get to that. Yes, we do. And so, and, 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 and all kinds of, of new ways. The, the news division of, of, of BuzzFeed has amazed in, in what it has done and really changed the entire brand and the entire view of the value of BuzzFeed. Um, I do not hear cat list jokes anymore. Well, you just made one, but okay. Yeah, okay. Um, so that's about bringing value into this new world. And you took the value we had and brought it in. Talk to me about your moral perspective across the two. Um, well, uh, yeah, I would just start from, uh, from the thing that you said earlier in your introduction, that uh, volume and tension necessarily leads to clickbait. And obviously it can. It, um, uh, that can be the ultimate expression of it. It can, however, lead to really good, important journalism that rises to the surface, that benefits from sharing and attention, that a story that you might start in quite a small way can multiply and multiply and multiply and have enormous world-changing impact. So um, we should be careful before we uh, throw away the 
openness in an expression of sin. If you like, I will externalise for you your guilt about openness and try and try and figure a way through it. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Doctor. <laughs> you're welcome. It's a moral <laughs> philosophy round. Um, uh, I was just I was just thinking when you were talking when. When Guardian Unlimited started, when The Guardian first started publishing on the internet, and there were people in this room that remember this better than me even, but, um, you know, we didn't really have, we didn't have Twitter. Um, we didn't really have Facebook. So if you want to think, oh God, what would the world be like if there were news organizations on the internet and not these hugely powerful platforms, then tragically, I am old enough to remember what that world was. It existed. <laughs> And, uh, and I know what it was. It was a bunch of journalists and very sincere uh, technologists who really... Um, remember that naive time where we all wanted to change the world and we were genuinely excited about and scared of the power that we had? And we would sit in rooms drawing diagrams on, short, on whiteboards that we didn't really understand what we were doing. We were drawing information architecture. We didn't know what we were doing. But what we were doing it from was the principles that we had been uh, schooled in and raised with, which were about informing, educating... Um, hosting a conversation, spreading what we thought was the best possible information. We built armies of active moderators. When we, opened, when we finally built our own ability to, to publish comments, we built armies of moderators to make sure there was no hate speech, to try and correct misinformation. We used to have endless threads about climate change in which we would try and beat down the climate deniers. Every single day we would get up and do the good work. We failed at that too, didn't we? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was, it was uh, uh, Sisyphean, but, you know, um, that's what we did. It never occurred to anybody in those early days of publishing on the internet to go, well, that's not our problem. No, nobody did that. Um, and then, you know, along came Facebook Connect and people started to outsource the conversation. At that point, historically, if we look back, we outsourced responsibility for how you host that conversation and how you moderate it. And as a society, not, not as a media industry, but as a society, I suspect what we did was we were really liberal, indulgent parents to these nascent platforms. Um, uh, I don't, I'm just, I'm, I'm this close to describing them as millennials. But <laughs> what, no, they're worse. We, we did, what, what we said was, oh, that's a really interesting thing. This has a huge amount of power to connect the world. It's got no real discernible business model, and it doesn't really seem to have any laws. But it's quite interesting. And then, uh, uh, and we let it be. We, we just let it be. We let them tell us that they wouldn't be evil and that they uh, just wanted to host conversation, and, and we let them be. As journalists, we... We bent over backwards. We were we were then raising teenagers, and we were giving them the bloody car keys. They were uh, they said, "We need you to do this. We need you to give us your articles. We need you to plug in our uh, comment software. We need you, we need you to do video now. We need you to do it less than three seconds. Put words on it." And and I feel like at this point, a sort of yeah, very liberal parent that uh, that didn't really take control of the situation and let it happen and happen and happen and uh, and also a bit cheated, I think. Um, we've come to events like this for many, many years, and journalists have uh, beaten themselves up. I've sat on panels and said, we must be this, we must be that. I think the media has tried very earnestly to engage, to um, listen. It needed reform urgently. We were in uh, all sorts of ivory towers handing down the words. Um, and it's been good for journalism in the main, for journalism, not distribution. Um, but we, we sort of played by the rules, and we're looking around and going, oh, that, that didn't go so well. We did everything that they wanted us to do, and it did not, and we're still not rewarded for it. And what we've got is the New York Times treated with the same authority as a teen teenager in a bedroom, uh, exactly as you say. Um, so we can take responsibility for being liberal parents, but I'm afraid, like a liberal parent now, we're just, <laughs> I now tend to feeling that we might have to go a bit authoritarian in correction, and uh, that leads me to uh, the regulation word, which we haven't used, and is probably not the right answer to a moral question. But I don't really. But, but you're see British, so. I'm British. I immediately went, oh, something must be done, pass a law. Um, <laughs> Start a commission. Um, you wait till I get started on tax. Um, uh, but I, I, don't, I, I genuinely don't, do not see any other way right now. We've got a, a massive content problem, we've got a massive revenue problem. Um, those two things, it seems to me, can only now be combated by uh, enforced regulation. I note that Mark Zuckerberg kindly acknowledged that he thought that perhaps he maybe should cooperate with maybe thinking about how regulation might happen. I feel like for about a year, 
most politicians and senior media figures have been sitting in rooms going, well, it's going to happen somehow. I'm not quite sure how, but it's going to happen. Um, we can discuss what that regulation might look at, look like, for, or as long as you like. I'm British, I will be available for the whole of the rest of the day <laughs> to offer a brief history of regulation, 1960 to the present day. Um, <laughs> but I would say this, as a, just a little final thought, it is worth asking why we are suddenly seeing all the platforms, not just Facebook, but all, all of them voluntarily taking responsibility for their actions. It is not because any of these problems have just come to light. They knew. They knew. Uh, they knew specifically about Cambridge Analytica. They knew what was happening with revenue. They started out sharing. They started to minimise the amount they were doing. And why, why was Zuckerberg in Congress this week? That was not the first time that they've been invited to go and speak to regulators. Um, they have been telling the British Parliament to do one for about five years, no, and that's a perfectly respectable position. But the reason they are taking responsibility is because of journalism. Because journalists wrote stories, People got really angry, other journalists amplified stories, people got more angry, people used concrete examples to show what was happening, and that has forced the change. I think it is time for regulation to step up. So I'm going to come back to the regulation, but let me pull back to what you said at the beginning in terms of trying to come up with a catalog of those areas of responsibility that they have, we have, or we share. What I heard you say is something that's, that's helped inform my cha ever-changing definition of journalism. And I, and, I, and I recently changed it to this, because I think, well, what, what does the world need in a time of polarization and, 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 and the demonization of the other? Uh, I think we have a responsibility in journalism that also the platforms have to convene communities into civil, informed, and productive conversation. So is that, is that notion of convening into a civil and productive and informed conversation. Is that a responsibility that the platforms have? And okay. putting a fence too around what's civil and uncivil. Um, but let's also just take it one step back. <clears throat> we do have a responsibility for the terms of conversation and for the terms of debate discussion. Mm. And I think as legacy news organizations, we understood that very well. See my thing earlier about we convened armies of moderators and wrote rules for them and tried to um, codify what free speech was. But Actually, uh, actually, our responsibility, our real job, is to inform. Our job is to find stuff out and then say it and then tell people. And that's become uh, very clarified, uh, hugely clarified, much, much more distilled over, over the last few years um, as we've combated fake news and bad actors and propaganda and deliberate misinformation. Our, our role to be utterly rigorous about what we're saying and then hopefully build authority around it is really... The, the conversational bit, it needs, it needs the pure information behind it. You can't hope to have a good conversation unless we can agree on the facts. You can't have a great conversation about climate change unless you can agree that it is changing. Yeah. And in order to do that, you need to have indisputable reporting going, this, that is, that, that's the case. So yes, I, 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 I'm not absenting us from the, from the role of convener of good discussion, of, um, uh, of a, a, a civilised society, but... We need to be clear about what we can do in order to be clear about what their job is. And, and, and our job is to produce... But is it their job to worry about the quality? I mean, Jack Dorsey put out his RFP recently saying that we're now going to pay attention to the health of the public conversation in the mm. public sphere. So do you agree that that's their job, that they have to make decisions? Um, they absolutely do. And it has been uh, uh, expedient for them for a very long time to say, yeah. let a thousand flowers bloom, everybody's voice is equal. Everybody's voice is not equal. <laughs> How British of you to say that too. <laughs> <laughs> all, all right, um, Congresswoman, um, write the legislation for us. I'm going to keep her on the hook for one more second. Uh, the, the regulation that you would like to create, uh, what are the headings of that regulation? <clears throat> um, I have been thinking about this a little bit. Um, and uh, I actually think uh, in rooms all around the world, um, especially after, I don't know, a couple of drinks, somebody will come up with a theory of how we can regulate platforms. Um, and there are, there are loads of them. I, I wonder if data is probably the easiest way in. I think I tend towards uh, a theory that people should be licensed for the access they have. Hi, British person. Um, but you know, we, when, when television started, when we suddenly had that, uh, that capacity, when we had the spectrum to broadcast into people's homes, 
then licenses were issued on the basis that that was an enormously powerful thing. You were going into people's homes. And by the way, I think the regulation of broadcast and the difference between the regulation of broadcast and the regulation of uh, in the internet is one of the problems in the spread of misinformation. If you are raised, and people older than everybody in this room, obviously because these are all babies, um, are raised with the expectation that if it's on television, it must be broadly true. I'm not talking about Fox News, I'm talking about British television news. But there, <laughs> it's very highly regulated, and, and there is a sort of, you know, it, uh, I remember the first time there was a, a made-up television scandal in the UK, and I remember my uh, grandmother saying to me, but it was on television. It must, it must be true. They can't, they can't say things that aren't true on television. Um, at the moment, even advertising is regulated more effectively. Um, and that's the problem with expectation. If you are sort of raised to believe that if it is put out, then it must be true, yeah. it's a yeah. huge cognitive dissonance to go, actually, 98% of it is probably bullshit. Um, so so how, did, how, did, how did that happen? People were licensed, and as part of the license, they had conditions that they had to oblige by. It was a license to print money. And therefore, if you, didn't, uh, if you didn't abide by the conditions of your license, it was taken away from you. And uh, there is now so much uh, law being passed, especially in the EU, around data and, the, uh, and what you can do in handling data and how, how much data you may hold and for how long and how you may share it. Um, every company that anybody here works for is spending a huge amount of time trying to work out how to recalibrate the way they own data. I know, maybe a good start is to think if you're going to hold the data of more than, say, 50 million people, then you have to be licensed to do that. You, there, there is law. And then you can attach conditions to it. I'm not actually a regulation expert. I know I'm just very, I'm a very enthusiastic hobbyist. But I, I think there are, uh, <laughs> there are probably ways that you can do this and attach some conditions that aren't out of the bounds of feasibility if you accept that they are responsible. Yeah, as an American, I get a little itchy when it comes to the idea of licensing um, the ability to hold information. But when the US TV networks got too powerful, there was regulation that separated broadcast and production yeah. that said, these things are too powerful, they control too much, and we are going to split them up. Raju, um, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Good luck with that. So the irony of uh, talking about all this at a conference where the top three sponsors are Facebook, Google, and Amazon <laughs> is interesting. Um, look, I, I think the fundamental issue I have is that we cannot outsource moral responsibility as individuals, as a profession, as a company, or as a platform. So the idea that um, we can point fingers and say that you have a moral responsibility to do something, I think it's good, but it can't be outsourced. So the reason I think Facebook got into the, its recent issues is because it outsourced the responsibility to Cambridge Analytica and others to kind of do something good or not bad with their data, and they just... So I think that's the fundamental issue that I'm having in thinking about this as who are we to kind of set, like, point fingers and say it as an industry, Look, I think journalism as an industry has been a, for a long time a pass-through industry, meaning that we, we just looked at it as saying our job is to take information and pass it through. We never really thought about the underlying business assumptions. And as our audiences became more digitally promiscuous, we are not a pass-through industry. We collect a lot of data. Right? We are now have to rely on that data. And it's not very different from what Facebook is kind of doing. So rather than kind of talk about it at a very philosophical level, I think I'm more interested in kind of saying, as I think uh, Janine was saying in a, based on your question, what do we then do about it, right? So I think the notion that we treat those who collect data as fiduciary owners of data, I think is a good philosophical and a moral framework. And we do that, right? I mean. The most personal data we give out is usually to doctors and accountants and lawyers. Mm -hmm. All of them are actually governed by fiduciary ownership of data. They can not disclose it. There are lots of like both moral and ethical uh, kind of guidelines around what they can do with it. So I think a similar idea that a Facebook has a fiduciary responsibility for data, I think would be a good way to think about it and then say, okay, so what does that mean? Um, and does that translate into certain uh, ownership responsibilities? Am I, am I giving them data 
and they can rent it from me and create a privacy economy in which I choose to participate and give me some value back. And I can decide how much of that value, right? either they pay me or they put a digital wallet where they can say, for every piece of data that you want to give out to third parties, not individually, not aggregated, we put X into your digital wallet. And what you do with it, you can buy more services. I could argue for a case where I would say, actually donate my wallet to subscribe to the Wall Street Journal, or right? So I think there are lots of ways to think about it which are practical um, and have some moral underpinnings. Um, and I think that may be a good way to kind of uh, back into regulation, if you will. Yeah, as you talk about that, I'm, I'm reminded of the, of the early days of blogging. Oh, they were wonderful. Um, we all loved each other, and we had blog roles, and we hugged. And, um, what is now portrayed as giving up data was then portrayed as sharing and speaking with the world. And what was seen as a, as a good now is seen as a kind of a danger. I mean, the information that was, that was shared at Cambridge Analytica, and I can have this completely wrong, but, but a lot of it was stuff that you chose to make public. And that in the blogging days, we said the ability to create a platform to enable anyone to speak to the whole world was a good. Is it still? The fundamental principle of it is still good, right? Meaning that there have never been more people able to consume journalism or information today than since the, whatever, the invention of the Gutenberg Press. And I guarantee you more people read about Cambridge Analytica on Facebook and Twitter than if they were reading those two publications that actually published it. Right? So I think in that I think in that sense it's good. The the question of like should there be trust indicators and should there be things that say that the source matters and certain sources are better than the others, I think is is not uncommon in in the sense that we've always kind of given some uh, credence to that, right? I mean you work at a university and in the university setting, accreditation was a way to say, actually, they'll meet a certain threshold. So I think those notions are actually pretty good. I'm, I'd be very curious, actually, I think it's interesting that we talk about this as though it's a new issue, but uh, Craig Newmark is here still somewhere, I think. I mean, he ran a platform called Craigslist and I'd be curious to think about what were the moral imperatives that we associated with them. And there were a lot of, we blamed them for a lot of our industry's woes, but I don't recall us saying, other than some classified ads kind of stuff, I don't recall us asking this question of Craigslist, saying what is the moral imperative? So it'll be, I'll be curious, uh, why is it that we suddenly are imposing this on uh, Facebook and others and don't seem to think that it's an issue with some other platforms. Are you okay to answer? <laughs> I can't speak for the uh, company today, but back in 99 when I had to make uh, some decisions about Craigslist, I decided to uh, monetize as little as possible. It's a better model of philanthropy to have people keep the money they need to put food on the table than to collect that money and then to someday, maybe 30 years after, get to give it back to them. Um, also in terms of privacy and so on, a principle is to collect as little as possible and to not even think about uh, sharing it or uh, selling it. It gets more complicated from there, but that's the, uh, that's the gist. When you spoke to my students many years ago at CUNY, and they, and they asked you, as, as business people did, kind of, why don't you put advertising on and maximize this thing? You called yourself a philanthropist of classified ads. And, and you were leaving money in the hands of the people to do what they wanted to with it. And then there's the, the fundamental economics of Craigslist were also that the less you charged, the larger you could grow, right? That the network economics were not bad. You used it to bring people that kind of benefit. Was that something you thought about at the time? Uh, not really. Uh, I'm not all that smart. <laughs> And at that point, prior to my just stepping down as a CEO, I was just doing things that made sense, that felt right, speaking as a nerd of the 1950s, because that's where my values and so on are formed. Even in Sunday school, being told that uh, I should learn to know when enough is enough. 
Um, so just uh, did it that way. And then uh, a year after starting the company, really realizing that as a manager, I uh, suck, turned it over to Jim, and he's continued that uh, tradition. Seriously, though, I really suck as a manager. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I want to I uh, talk, bring everybody into this conversation. But but to where we stand so far, I hear you talking about uh, the, the public conversation, maintaining the public conversation away from manipulation. I hear you talking about uh, transparency as an ethic. Uh, I hear truth, a difficult standard. Um, I hear data and fiduciary responsibility for data. And then I hear quality and making decisions about quality. Um, one question, and then I want to see what all you want to ask about this and contribute. We believe that it's our job in journalism to inform the public conversation. One might argue we've done a fairly piss poor job of it considering the quality of that public conversation, but we try. What responsibility do the platforms have to the informedness, that's a Facebook word, not mine, of the public conversation? Anybody? What responsibility do the platforms, do the platforms have? have to the the, the in, informing the public. Um, yeah. I absolutely think they have a responsibility, and I don't think it's enough to just say, we're an online community and we're connecting people, yay, more connections are better. More connections are great, but it has to be on the basis of the world is round, that whole truth part. And I think that that's why we got into this whole um, fight in the aftermath of the 2016 elections and Brexit and lots of other things about real content versus fake content. I don't want to use that term fake news because it's been appropriated and renamed and, and, and redefined. Claire Ward will, will, will hit you. And, yeah, and, 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 <laughs> and, I, and I agree. I don't want to be hit, but I agree. I think the word doesn't make s it's lost meaning. It's become weaponized against journalists, and it doesn't mean what it used to mean. I wanted to just say one thing. In the list of words that you were throwing out, one word that you did not throw out, which I think belongs out there, and it's less about media because we have not, it's more about p platforms, is privacy. We haven't put the word privacy explicitly on the list, although of course Raju was referring to it with talking about data. But I do think that that's something that we have to think about. And again, one of the comments that I think it was, um, maybe it was Dick Durbin who said to Mark Zuckerberg, would you feel comfortable telling everyone now the world where you, st what hotel you stayed in last night? And Mark Zuckerberg said, um... No. And then he said, okay, and you know, would you feel comfortable if we had all of your information and blah, blah, blah. And Mark Zuckerberg had to admit, no, I don't feel comfortable with that. So it, it is, I do think privacy is, is something there. And, and one of the thing that I think is really important is um, safety is something about that civil conversation. And as a longtime national security foreign policy journalist, I go back to this extremism on the internet, and it does bother me. And Zuckerberg kept repeating this, this statistic for which he gave absolutely no proof and no basis, saying 99% of extremist content has been removed from Facebook. Really? That's Prove like, it. Like Prove it to me. What does that even mean? 99%? Where did you get that figure? Right? And even if that were true, independently verifiable, which he has not verified for anybody, then even 1% with 2.2 billion registered users on Facebook, and I don't want to just pick on Facebook, this applies to all platforms, even 1% of that is a huge amount of extremist content. Just a couple days ago, there was an, uh, you know, some ISIS beheading videos on, um, that you could find on the platforms. So you know, there's a whole lot of um, extremist, disturbing content out there that I don't think is education in the service of democracy. And I think we also have to remember that democracy itself, you, know, you, you talk about openness as a democratic value, and that was the sort of foundation principle of all this, but I think we had forgotten, we sort of maybe were, um, you know, I don't know, got lazy and forgot that democracy is vulnerable. And Maria is living that right now in the Philippines. It is vulnerable. It's vulnerable to malicious intent and malign actors and hate speech and extremism and misinformation and all sorts of things. And all the fact checking in the world that we can do can ultimately maybe change people's minds on a discrete issue, but studies show it's also not changing people's votes and behavior. So these right, are which all I think goes to, goes deep to this question of the conversation. Problems. But I, I also want to, and I tried with Roger, I'll raise it with you again. Is yes, privacy matters, and we have many protections for privacy. But I would also argue that publicness matters. That the ability we have to publish now, anyone to speak, is an important new structure of the world. And I don't want 
any fucking one to stop Maria Ressa from publishing. Right, whether that's a government or whether that's anyone else. And so the notion that Maria can be public or that anyone can be public is also part of this, Maria. But, oh, sorry. No, just because no, but I just to what just Janine about to stop said. Maria from speaking. <laughs> <laughs> but as Janine said, not everybody's voice is equal. Maria's platform. Which is an important Maria, change, in, I think, in the view we have of this internet thing, which Janine touched on earlier. And Rappler is a legitimate, vetted news source that publishes real information, as opposed to someone use the word Joe Schmo, who's just making stuff up in his basement. Oh, let's be careful. Not let's all be careful though, yeah. about maligning the Joe Schmoes because we are all Joe Schmoes. <laughs> We're all Joe Schmoes. Right? We don't want to be elitist and talk about just the people oh. who are mass again who are silent again. No. That's what I'm trying to say. I'm not being be elitist about, about it, but some people actually are using vetted facts and some people like QAnon stuff on the internet or stuff mm. you find down the Reddit channels or in 4chan, that is not actually true information. So guess what? That is not equal to voices of people who are actually gathering facts. That's not Maria. the same. Um, so, so, okay. That, I'll, keep, um, I'll jump off of some of what Indira said, which is number one, we don't have to call Facebook or Twitter a publisher. They're the world's largest distributor of news. They are a distributor of news, and that comes with responsibility. Um, right now, again, those algorithms are using mob rule in order to determine how they, they distribute the news. That doesn't quite work. We all, all know that. And they be, really did this starting in 2015 when they took all of our platforms. And yes, we are news platforms now. Uh, we're just not as good as the tech platforms. Um, and they took all of us into instant articles. And like Janine said, we walked in. Here we go. I put all of Rappler on, on instant articles. Um, but they're our best partner, right? They're, they're frenemies that we want to do better because as they do better, we will do better. 97% of Filipinos on the internet are on Facebook. That is our public space. The second is that terrorism research, we come from the same background. Um, you guys remember in December 2015 when Mark Zuckerberg said, there's no fake news. Um, there is nothing. It's 1%. He also used the same number. Yeah. Um, it's a made-up number. The platforms already know how to deal with terrorists and terrorist networks on their platforms. And this is where I come in, social network analysis. When you, when you go through it, uh, why do you have to wait for journalists to point out that the Internet Research Agency, uh, and then you use that to pull out the network when you know what the malevolent networks are because you have the data? And we have to turn cartwheels to be able to get that data. They, that's the first step. I think that you know, not democracy is vulnerable, but more than that, George Orwell said it in 1984, right? The greatest power is to take what you know and then smash it into atom smithereens and then reformat it into what the platform wants. I've completely butchered that quote, but I'll tweet it, right? Um, <laughs> this is power. And, you know, uh, so I am living through this. We saw it very early. I feel like Cassandra. Um, and we're still living through it. So push, please, do something about it. Um, I think... Uh, I think what really needs saying is that I don't believe that anyone wants to go back. I don't, yes. I don't believe anybody, um, even the most rose-tinted version of a... Pre when we were all gods of authority and power, I don't remember that time. <laughs> but it, um, no, I don't think anyone wants to go back. I don't want, think anyone wants to give up the ability to uh, distribute a story as far and as wide as possible and to uh, galvanise change, to um, uh, generate conversation and action. Uh, and I, I truly believe that um, journalism has in the main been improved by opening up, by being less um, handing down words of wisdom and, and, and being, uh, being, being more open to the contributions that Joe Schmoes make. Um, but you can sue the distributor for distributing a libelous story. You know, news agents, news distributors could be sued for distributing a libelous story. I'm not, absolutely not suggesting, even my radical regulation um, campaign, that we want to see a situation where uh, Facebook and Twitter and Google are responsible for every story they publish. That would be ridiculous. However, and I come back to my liberal parents' um, analogy, we can't just sit in the living room and go, it'd be really nice if you did some washing up occasionally. We're gonna, there needs to be some sort of mechanism. We are in this together. I think my point was... We tried earnestly to partner with them wherever they told us we were going. And I'm not sure that's been a reciprocal relationship. Roger. I, I mean, I, I just want us to want to remind us that we need to look in the mirror first before we do this. I guarantee you a majority of people in this room 
work at media companies that use Tabula and Outbrain. Right? They are worse than Facebook. Right? So we seem Amen. to have no problems doing exactly the kind of things that we blame the big platforms just because they have scale. Right? So I think it's important for us to not be holier than thou about this. At the same time, demand better from all of us. Right? So I think that idea that um, there should be standards, but we should begin by applying it to ourselves. And we are, I must say that one of the things that we don't give enough credit for is until Facebook came along, we never had the ability to individually manage our data. Right? Facebook actually gives you a lot of options. They make it very hard. You need to really pay attention to it. But until they came along, nothing you did on the internet you could actually control on your own. And I still don't know of a media company that gives us that ability to manage the data that they collect. I mean, you should go to any website and see the number of trackers and cookies they have, a so, lot less than Facebook. Right? So I think it's important for us to kind of acknowledge that we have been bad actors as well. It is true that every, every uh, newspaper organization that did a story last week about how to deactivate your Facebook page, detailed instructions on how to deactivate your Facebook uh, profile, had about 1,600 Facebook trackers on the story. And no instructions for what to do about that. And, and Raj, you mentioned a very important world, word here, which is about the change, which is scale. Scale is the, is the friend and the enemy at the same time. Scale is what enables every Sally Schmo to act, talk to every Joe Schmo across the world. But scale is also what makes it impossible to manage yeah. and, and scale. Yes, Maria. Uh, sorry, uh, just um, to be devil's advocate to Raju, though, I think that, uh, yes, news publishers uh, are doing that, uh, but we are not, we don't have uh, an army of engineers that are focused on just growing, uh, using that data in a way that grows us uh, in the way that the platforms do, right? So, so part of it is, I think, like, let's go back to where we started, which is that um, we each had our emails, uh, people would go to the news groups, and we had communities we built organically before Facebook and Twitter ever came along. And we gave all of that to Facebook. So there's really such Some a of us difference. Did. Yeah, okay, lots of us. Um, a lot, uh, I think there's that difference in scale fundamentally changes that world, right? It's the same way big data changes your Excel sheet. So that's why there's, a, you know, I don't want us to be journalists because we really openly tear ourselves apart all the time and let us not lose focus on what we need to do. There's a fundamental change, that change in scale moving from an Excel sheet to big data, which is where it is, and those types of patterns that you only see when you have that kind of big data. is very, very different from what individual news groups have, nor the competency of what individual tech people in news groups have. Maria, I'll, to devil's advocate, you're right. devil's advocate. And then go, I am coming go, go, out go. here. I am coming out here. Is that I also believe that the fu if there's a future for our business, and notice the conditional clause, yes. that I believe we have to move past mass. We have to move past treating everybody the same. That means that I've got to gr bring you greater relevance and value. That means I need to know you as an individual or a member of a community. That means I have <gasps> data on you. And we have no skills in our industry, let alone ethics. We have no skills whatsoever in our industry to know you as an individual and serve you better as a result. That's something we can actually learn from these guys and try to do it right. But, but I, yes, I don't but. know if that works, right? Because look, on Rappler, we have a choice. Are we gonna personalize it or are we going to give you the news? We have editorial judgment, right? You may not like that the budget has grown seven times on intelligence funds of the Philippine government, but in, in less than a year, um, but you need to know that, right? So. Personalization, we made the choice not to do personalization, and we still grew. What we did is we walked into it as news groups. News people will do different things with this, and perhaps that's the thing. We do need to work with the platform. Well, then you also have to think about the scale of the individual. The Guardian publishes, I think in my memory, five to 600 pieces of content a day. The Wall Street Journal, how many pieces of content a day? Yes. I mean, hundreds. At, at GMG, we published uh, 88,000 pieces last year. Okay, so, 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 so my only point about that is, the poor individual is outscaled. They can't deal with all that. We have to help them get to what matters to them. So that's, I don't think personalization is a bad thing. But isn't that the echo chamber that then splinters us into groups? That's what I was trying, that's what we need to try. Or is it relevant? The biggest group we're putting right now is the mass. 
You are all the same. You will all like the same product. That's a group you put into. No, but the first thing that you do is when you do that search, you're already looking for what you want. So what we can serve them what they want. And then they can search again. So that the action point is in your hands, mm -hmm. not an algorithm that is feeding you <laughs> sneakers because you chose to look Jeanine, at sneakers. Janine, you were going to so jump we in. Can't, we here. can't complain about the fact that the uh, New York Times is treated with the same authority as chap in bedroom if we uh, uh, cede all the authority mm -hmm. of our editorial That's judgment, right. of our reporting, That's of our right. fact-checking, and say, yeah, no, I mean, I don't know what story is more important. Tell me what you want to read. Right. I mean, <laughs> right. Right. Uh, all right, I'm coming to help you. <laughs> so I'm going to try and turn this into a... So I'm, I'm Peter Bale. I'm the launch editor of Wiki Tribune. Um, and I'm going to try and turn this into a question rather than an assertion, but I'm absolutely in the middle of this at the moment at Wiki Tribune. And I can tell you that I no longer believe that neutrality is a possibility in news because it is all about judgment. Welcome to the dark side, Peter. And, uh, and I say that after 100 years of working at Reuters 100 years ago, um, I, I am not going to publish stories uh, which say um, uh, Harvey Weinstein, good or bad, you decide, mm -hmm. women's harassment, does it actually exist? Mm -hmm. I am not going to publish that stuff anymore. Anyway, can you, because I think there is an issue here, including where, where I am at the moment, between uh, a US libertarian First yeah. Amendment and Rand view of the world, and yeah. another and another view of the world, which is which you know very well, which is Germany. A little bit of regulation. Let's also remember that one of the reasons why why uh, Spectrum was regulated was not just because it was important, but because it was a public asset. And so I think maybe there is an importance aspect here that we do have to get back to some regulation, but hopefully by people who actually know what they're talking about. <laughs> but can you address this? This no, I don't mean that you don't. I mean I'm probably a politician. This issue between I mean, to me, the internet is fundamentally a First Amendment space, and fundament the way it's been built is a fundamentally libertarian product. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that then bumps up, as Timothy Garton Ash pointed out in his very, very good book, Free Speech, on this, it bumps up against German attitudes, it bumps up against cultural attitudes, and then it also bumps up against Chinese and single-party states. So how do, we, how do we square that set of circles? Yeah. And, and you're right, as, as Lawrence Lessig says, code is law, and code is the Constitution. And code is also opinion, too. Um, yeah, but I want to answer that quickly because I want to get voices in the room. Well, I just want to say one thing and then defer to Raju. But um, since Janine used the word licensed, you know, talking about in Britain, uh, about broadcast being licensed, I mean, we are an unlicensed, uh, um, set aside the FCC, okay, but we are an unlicensed profession in the United States. You know, journalists don't need to get licenses to be journalists. And so we're not regulated. And the free speech, you know, absolutism that we have in the U.S., I, th I think, has sort of set the standard for the values that the platforms have. I do think it's problematic because I agree with Janine who says that, you know, people say, well, I saw it on TV, so it must be true. In Britain, there's some basis for thinking that. Unfortunately, in the United States, there's little basis for thinking that when you say it's saw it on TV or our own president has said, well, I saw, I only know what I saw on the internet. Remember the famous Trump quote, well, I only know what I read on the internet and, you know, well, it must be true. I mean, obviously not. Obviously, the majority of what we see on the internet, I don't know if I can say majority, but a lot of stuff we see on the internet is not at all true and uh, and and I do think it's a problem and I mean I come out of that American system but uh, I don't know I, I want to defer to Raju on and, this. And, and Peter so, the other issue we have is the quality of the government involved which is an issue right now. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that anybody in the US well I shouldn't speak for all of the US but I think the consensus is that there is a problem I think that the challenge becomes how do we address it and that's where the free speech line gets used. Uh, so I'm not, I don't think that anybody in the US is necessarily saying be absolutist and don't do anything about it, right? I think that's the debate that the US is having. I also must push back very strongly against citing Germany as the beacon of goodness because what Germany and I think to an extent the EU have done is actually given more power to Google and Facebook to decide. Yes. In Germany, they passed the law. They were supposed to have um, a panel to adjudicate, none of that has happened. So Facebook is like fully empowered now because there is actually no ability to go to somebody else and discuss this or say, is this good or bad? So laws can sometimes really get ahead of trying to solve the problems we're trying to solve. Let's come here. Uh, okay, so my Net Novak, I used to be the Swedish media commissioner. I was on the WEF board together with Roger a year ago. Um, I just wanted to pick up on this because I think this is, uh, we've had the call for more legislation 
And having worked drafting media law, I know the difficulties, and I would like to say that I think legislation will backfire. Uh, uh, we, um, we tend to think that, I mean, first of all, digital is transnational. So any law we pass somewhere will uh, be good, possibly in some context, and backlash against this community in other contexts. Uh, I also believe that regulating the internet would hurt internet neutrality. So I don't think uh, the, the idea of doing the same as we did with broadcasting and licensing, it doesn't work without having very dire consequences. And last of all, I would like to say that any regulation passed as a legislation, I think it could hurt uh, journalism and freedom of speech. So I would like to throw a question to the panel about what about self-regulation? And uh, as the worst offender of this, uh, I'm a fast-talking New Yorker. I've just been asked to remind everyone to slow down because it's easier for the translators. And I apologize personally because I am the worst. Um, <laughs> go ahead and answer that, Maria, and then I'm going to come over here. Okay, so, uh, so I, I think, yes, uh, in the Philippines, I, I testified in front of the Philippine Senate to say that, because uh, imagine the people who will be creating the laws probably know less than the people on the platforms as we've seen, right? Um, so yes, self-regulation, but there must be. Look, there are already existing laws that regulate journalists. Um, why are they not being used on platforms? I think there's this artificial boundary that the platforms are, are sticking to, that's first. But the second thing is on, on the, the last part is please let us not forget that free speech is being used to stifle free speech, mm -hmm. right? That is what we're seeing. Freedomhouse.org November last year came out with a study that said in 65 countries around the world, in 30 of the 65 countries, they're seeing cheap armies on social media rolling back democracy. Who is protecting those people? The Philippines is one of those countries. And then finally, um, by not, by sticking to this analysis paralysis, uh, we're sticking, you know, we're platform, is it whatever, is it media, who cares? The problem is here, it's now. People are dying in the global south, right? Uh, what are you gonna do about it? And if you can't do anything about it, then for God's sake, shut down in our countries. Um, so abdicating responsibility with no action or little action, allows governments in other parts of the world to use the same exact tactic. And that's what's happening. Um, we're seeing now, because Facebook has enabled an alternative reality and an alternative media in the Philippines, these pro-government bloggers, and it's not just the Philippines, you're talking about Myanmar, you're talking about Sri Lanka, you're talking about South Africa, you're talking about uh, other countries, Venezuela, I mean, other countries here. These governments, our governments, are now using them instead of media. So shut down the problem first. Solve it. You can't wait five to 10 years. We're going to be dead by then. Uh, we have 10 minutes left. I want to get voices from, uh, from out here among the schmoes. Yeah, thank you. My name is Mohamed Tafak, and I'm uh, studying Masters in Media and Communication Science. I have a lot of questions, but I am just asking uh, two or three questions. The first question is, yeah, like you, all of them talked about the function of the media to inform the people, but it was, I think it was the function, but not now. Because if you just Google, like uh, you just searched one sentence, what is the function of media? So first you will get the answer, information, education, and entertainment. And then the second sentence would be the entertainment, entertainment, and entertainment. And then now, in the information age, if you just search this sentence again, so you will see the information, agenda setting, and propaganda. Because if you see the lot of international broadcasting companies like CNN, Effect, Russia Today, DW, so I always read about the, like the refugees are becoming the prostitutes in Berlin, they have a lot of problems from the Russia Today, they have different perspective. So media do not have uh, any kind of like uh, responsibility to inform only, but they are propagating and they are setting the propaganda and agenda. And the second thing about advertising, like because the government paying the companies billions of the dollars in terms of like advertisement about the health issues to inform people, but it's not just to inform people, they have a particular agenda to set to think what they want to think people about. So they are setting agenda. So how media should survive 
to not to become a particularly agenda setters or the propagandist of the advertisers so how they can survive in this information age uh, uh, yeah. anyone want to respond when you were saying oh come on <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a good point of view uh, than a question per se, but the que I, there are lots of sessions for the next few days talking about how does media, media look past advertising, including one at 5.30 this evening. Um, so I, I think it might be good to discuss this in that kind of a setting rather than yeah. moral imperatives. All right, hold on. <laughs> And, and as for uh, inform versus propaganda and entertain, I, you can't define, I mean, media is not a monolith, obviously. And within the term media, there's state-run media, there's propagandistic media, there's false information. I mean, so I think what we're talking about is the legitimate press here. And sorry for using a word if it sounds elitist, but there is legitimate fact-based. I'm part of the fact-based press universe. That's me. I'm sorry. I'm willing to own it, okay? I'm okay with that. I'm part of the fact-based press. And not, not everybody is part of the fact-based press. And I, I just want to respond to the previous thing. Um, Self-regulation is great, but back to um, uh, liberal parenting. Um, there has to be an all. There, ha there has to be. So it may be that um, everything I've said is completely specious, made-up nonsense. That's possible. But there has to be something that says, if you don't self-regulate, then there is this consequence. And for journalists, that is, self-regulation works actually pretty well. Yeah. Um, and the consequence is, if you don't self-regulate, you're going to be bankrupted in the libel courts. Yeah. Right. And, and yeah. I'm saying, you yeah. cannot sue these platforms for every story they publish. You can't but there has to be some other consequence. And right. if you lie or plagiarize, you get fired and your reputation is right. gone. But with the- with codes of conduct that we all abide by. Right, but, but with the platform self-regulating, I think Mark Zuckerberg has an overly optimistic view of artificial intelligence. Yeah. He yeah. thinks that artificial intelligence is going to detect fake and extremist content, and that's a great idea, but f artificial intelligence can also be used by bad guys to circumvent detection. So I think humans are a vital part of the process. My name is Courtney Radge, I'm with the Committee to Protect Journalists, and I did my doctoral research in Egypt, and it was very important that citizen journalists were able to go online and bring information to the public. And what I've been writing about recently is looking at how the algorithms and artificial intelligence that you actually just said were great have been leading to censorship of content being produced by citizen journalists and media outlets in Syria, in Myanmar, um, anti-Modi content in India, and so I want to hear, I think we understand the challenges for you know, the mainstream news industry, but what are the challenges that you see for the unintended consequences of taking more extremist content offline? So you said, you know, if 1% remains online, that's still a lot of content. But similarly, if you make 1% mistake with that amount of content, you've taken off a ton of legitimate content. So it's really challenging. And I think when we talk about self-regulation, you need the principles of transparency, accountability, and remedy. And right now, there's no independent audit or oversight for what Facebook or these other um, platforms are removing. And that should be available. We should be able to see the content that has been removed under these different schemes of countering hate speech or violent extremism or whatever. There needs to be remedy. And it shouldn't be so difficult to get information from Facebook. A, my question yesterday, what is your revenue sharing agreement with, with news? organizations, yeah. what news organizations are on free basics in specific countries? Why are we as media and researchers having to spend so much time to get very basic information? Great. Yeah. Yeah. Just, I'll give one specific example. Uh, there's a lot of debate about uh, political ads on Facebook, and part of the problem is some of us see some of them and not everybody sees everything. So mandating that Facebook put all its political ads in a place that anybody can look at all of them, so not just see the ones targeted at you, would be a good start, right? California has a law that says if a data breach happens, you need to inform within a certain time those individuals. The advantage of a law like that is nobody knows where Californians live, so as a result, they're now informing everybody that there's a data leak. So there are practical ways to address these issues, I think, without necessarily getting into massive debates about the First Amendment. Um, so I, I 
I think Egypt was a perfect example because they knew right away early on. So they were 2011, right? And we were celebrating that. But the guy from Google, do you guys remember Wael Ghanim? Mm -hmm. um, he, by 2015, was talking about the dangers. And I, when he told me, I was like, oh, really? Uh, I can't see. I was like, Jeff, I was like, this is so good in the Philippines. Well, it just took a little while longer. Um, uh, here's a fundamental thing that we all in news groups use. People. We hire people. Um, and why are tech platforms exempt from hiring people who make these judgment calls who can then teach the algorithms, right? And then actually have to be liable for the wrong calls as we are. Um, so, so that's the first is $40 billion revenue in 2017 certainly means that they could do that, and they are. Mark Zuckerberg said that they would double, but I don't think that's enough given the base. The, the other part of that is that um, Google is far better at revenue sharing, so I see both the business and the journalism in Rappler, right? Um, Facebook was allowed us to scale at the beginning. We were a startup in 2012. We couldn't have become the third top online news site in a year and a half without Facebook. But at the same time, Facebook is also where, um, my, uh, you know, we were attacked, where the propaganda machine, where government took over and reformulated reality. Um, let me just say state-sponsored hate, so I can't say government. State-sponsored hate, right? most of the content creators now working for government. So, so the question there goes back to, is Facebook serious about tackling this problem? We prefer self-moderation, absolutely. But even in the moderation, these half attempts uh, that they do, there's talk about uh, the call centers being infiltrated by supporters. There's no transparency. So mm -hmm. echoing what Indira said is the transparency. I guess those three things that we already know where it's led. Um, there must be an iterative process, which tech knows how to do better than journalists, not doing anything, which has been, it's been a year and a half now that we've been talking about this. Not doing anything is the worst thing. And then the third one is, if you're operating in countries with different systems and different cultures, for God's sake, Please get somebody who understands the country you're operating mm -hmm. in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, you know, I, but, I, but I've also been thinking lately, Maria, is that is that Zuckerberg has said that he's hiring twenty thousand people to uh, police uh, this stuff. If you just look at the, so there's twenty thousand shit pickers being hired, right? For How many? Two point three billion. True, and this is a, this is an international versus national comparison in the U.S. But there are now fewer than thirty thousand journalists on daily newspapers in the U.S. Right. So what does that say about our priorities as a society right now? Uh, forget companies, but just in general, is that we are forcing investment in trying to find the crap rather than create the quality. That's an issue. We've got like one minute left. So literally, okay. we've got one minute to share, okay. and then we've got to go, and I apologize to so just really one quick thought. I love what you brought up, the woman from the Committee to Protect Journalists. I, all your points were excellent. And just to give you an example, literally just on Tuesday, a news organization, I don't want to name them, but raised with me the issue that they are trying to cover the Chinese government in a critical way. And this person said to me that basically YouTube is working with the Chinese government to remove all self-immolation videos of Tibetan monks and Tibetan activists and what a problem this is and how it's essentially YouTube is participating in the censorship of a political issue and what a challenge that is for them. So that's a huge problem. I think that I see it as a problem. Facebook, remember, they when they had the human moderators and were then slammed for deprioritizing conservative content, that is what bit them in the backside and why I think they're so hesitant to bring on human moderators. And I'm not as sure that I believe that the 10,000 are going to be doing what we're talking about doing, the 10 to 20,000 that he talked about. But anyway. A so. 140 tweet from each and then we'll. I only want to amplify and uh, agree uh, fully with Maria and with what you're saying. This is hard and uh, difficult and more expensive than using an algorithm and yet still incredibly critical and important. These are the biggest companies in the world. At the beginning, we let them go, oh, we don't really have any revenue, we can't really afford it, it's not scalable. Nothing is true empirically. That is not the law of technology. It is hard and difficult and expensive and they have to do it. Raju, a final tweet? Uh, just throwing people at Facebook is not going to solve it. Uh, I think we are applying a very media, people come to us model that is totally busted anyway, and try to use that prism to solve Facebook's issues is not going to help. 
So I want to thank everyone on the panel and everyone here, and I want to mention one more thing. Oh, applaud them, applaud them. <laughs> um, programming note, this afternoon at 3.15, I was to, uh, scheduled to interview Campbell Brown from Facebook on stage. Campbell has withdrawn from the conference. However, we're going to go ahead and have a session about Facebook. And the challenge is, what should Facebook do for news? So very focused on journalism, and I urge you to come and join that conversation. And thank you for joining this one. Good day.